Well, welcome back to Open to Truth, a podcast all about exploring big ideas and discovering truth together. My name's Clint. Hi, I'm Tony. Welcome back. And the big idea I'd like to explore today is atonement. Mm. Yeah. At one mint. I don't know if that's the right etymology of it, but... What does it mean? It means uh, a theology, a doctrine describing how humanity can be at one with God or reconciled or in right relationship, I would put it. Okay. So one view off the top is uh, there, there, nothing happened. On <laughs> like There, there uh, is no way to be made right with God. Because either God doesn't exist yeah. or maybe another... Religion thinks that you are God, like yep, sure. pantheism or panentheism. Yep. So there is no gap. No gap. It's all um, an illusion. But in, in Christian theology, uh, there's this bloke, Jesus, mm-hmm. who died on a cross, and that something really significant happened there, bridging the gap between humanity and God. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be cool to explore some of the main theories that describe how that gap is bridged it's not universally agreed upon no. among all christians what exactly happens there on the cross maybe mm. that's surprising news to you but it's true if you don't believe me do a bunch of right. look at all your worship songs because there's various modes being described in different worship songs of what went on on the cross yeah there's uh like what are some examples of little <laughs> lyrics um that jesus blood washes us clean nothing mm-hmm. but the blood of jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of jesus yeah uh praise the one who paid my debt so the idea that there's some debt that needed to be paid and jesus dying on the cross paid that for us Mm -hmm. uh death is defeated death is the king is alive yep it's more resurrection but still yeah that the cross made a fool of death and Mm -hmm. and sin uh redemption being bought back out of slavery there's that's a motif that ends up in in songs uh, there's a song. Is it um Phil Wickham? Mm. You are beautiful. Sure, you're, you're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Just, just maybe a. There's something beautiful on display mm-hmm. there on the cross. Um, yeah, the day that true love died. He has a song called that. I think that's kind of a cool name. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so this crops up different um expressions of how to understand this atonement, um, bridging. Is that fair? This bridging the gap between humanity yeah, yeah. and God idea moving forward yeah yeah. okay that's what it means so i think the most prominent theory about this is called the penal substitutionary atonement Mm -hmm. so penal involving like a law or legal system and substitution meaning someone someone takes the place of someone else Mm -hmm. Um, so let's kind of walk through that view and then explain what are the Maybe pros and cons of it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I think to understand the penal part, there is this idea, certainly in the old God's law, the Ten Commandments even. Let's just Mm -hmm. run with that. Mm -hmm. Here are these uh, moral precepts of the cosmos that if you are in violation of them, you you have fallen short of the ideal. Mm -hmm. Or as Romans and Paul says in Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah. Okay. You've missed the mark. Yep. And fair enough. It does, of course, I am not God, unlike the Eastern religions that we mentioned <laughs> at the top. So there is a gap. Yeah. I've fallen short. I am not identical either individually or morally. Yeah. There are differences. So I've fallen short. Now, he makes another interesting claim that we can wonder about what it means, but I think a particular interpretation of it lends itself toward penal, and that's the wages of sin or that falling short, Mm -hmm. is death. Mm -hmm. So the wages kind of meaning like you've earned it, like you earned a paycheck, you earn your wage. Well, when you do some sins, you earn back death. Well, what kind of death? Uh, In the Garden of Eden, we see Adam and Eve expelled from the garden Mm -hmm. out of the presence of God or out of paradise due to that sin. So there's separation involved, and like this day you will surely die. There's a physical death physical is death. suddenly on the table. Yeah. yeah. And we can wonder what uh, like eternal death might mean. And there's a whole bunch of views about hell. Yep. Is it annihilation? Is it eternal conscious torment? But each of those would be classified under eternal death. Yeah. And I think if you l- loop in some other, through systematic theology, other biblical passages, you might argue that that's included in the wages of sin is death. There's this other more weighty price than just that your you physical death. Also deserve. Yep. Yep. 
that you, yeah, you deserve due to you're your falling failing. short. Yeah. Okay, so that's the that's the penal part that I stand guilty. You're a criminal before God, a cosmic yep. criminal, we of violating are. God's law. Mm-hmm. And they're not arbitrary laws; they're they're pretty good. Yeah, the Ten Commandments: honor your father and mother. Yeah, right. fell, fell fell short there. Yeah, um, lying, stealing, and murdering. We've well, and then Jesus talks about how each of those can be internalized, and even yeah. if you're angry. You're a murderer. Right, sets the and, bar even higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so not only my deeds, but my thought, yep. life, can, my intentions incri- can incriminate me yeah. in this cosmic courtroom, yeah. so to speak. Okay. Now, what happens with the cross? And correct me if I'm not saying this right. Is because I want to be really charitable sure. to each of the views. I want someone who holds to the penal substitutionary view to be like. Yeah, exactly. That's dude. the view. What other thing could there possibly? What are you gonna say next? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now, as I understand it, um, it's part of God's providential plan from the very beginning to rescue humanity mm. from the poor choices that they make. They fell. There was a falling from grace, the falling short, and we are now gonna save humanity from their predicament of having fallen short of my God's moral law. Mm-hmm. Because look, um, when you do that, when you fail like you punishment is incurred death i want to save you from that i love you Mm -hmm. so i'm going to send my son jesus who is perfect second person of the trinity also god again mysterious different podcast yep but he's coming down to earth he's incarnated and he is going to die on a cross uh just so happens that's the method of death at the time Mm -hmm. he came around didn't have to be a cross necessarily I i don't think so no That'd be pretty That'd be bizarre. Strange. Um, but he came to be a perfect sacrifice. So now it's looping in this other Old Testament idea that we can get really in the weeds here, but the basic idea is, look, the, the people of Israel back in the Old Testament also committed sins, mm-hmm. and God was not happy with that. And so you could sacrifice. Something else could shed blood instead of you, for the sins to be forgiven. So without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins Mm -hmm. is a, a a pretty deeply held thought in Jewish uh, culture Mm -hmm. and religious life. So there'd be a goat or whatever. Yeah. A goat, right. Mm -hmm. Or a sheep, sheep, goat, lamb, lamb, uh, that's slain, uh, each year, I think, Mm -hmm. um, as a symbol for the whole people's, you know, forgiveness of sins. And so God would be appeased. So the wrath of God Get a clean against slate. sin, like sin's really bad. Yeah. So he has wrath toward it and that appeases it. Like the, the payment has been, uh, you've, you've paid me back yeah. for what you've done. Okay. Now thinking of Jesus as a perfect sacrifice. So now, uh, like instead of doing this every year with an animal to appease the wrath of God, let's send my son who's perfect. And this will cover the sins for all time for all people. Wow, mm. wow, wow. Because, and the Trinity matters here, where this is God himself paying the penalty and it, yeah. it's appeasing it. So, But it gets it can be a little bit tricky to understand. I just don't want to get too far in the weeds. We're mm-hmm. sticking with atonement. Um, and so what happens on the cross is called the double imputation. So the sins of humanity are heaped upon christ jesus as he's on the cross uh, all of your deeds thoughts for everyone of all time jesus is bearing the weight of that um and you have you know there's some glimmer of this idea perhaps in like father father why have you forsaken me or my god my god why mm-hmm. have you forsaken me jesus is crying that out on the cross and like mm-hmm. why would you say that well there's something about like this experience of feeling the weight of uh, the sins of the world on his shoulders, he expires. The debt has now been paid, just like the lambs and goats of old. Um, sh- blood has been shed. The perfect sacrifice. Uh, the punishment are- has been dealt for sin. Yes, the punishment has been dealt. Now, I said double imputation because now on the flip side, we might stand before God on the end of days and say, well, look, Jesus paid all my sins. Uh, so I would like to be with you forever in paradise. But only... Perfection can be in God's presence, 
So the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you. Just as he became sin, we mm -hmm. receive his righteousness. Yeah. And there's glimmers of this too in the Old Testament. I think Abraham is the first one where it says his uh, faith toward Yahweh, toward God, is accredited to him as righteousness. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting, yeah. that phraseology. And so I think the penal substitutionary guys or gals uh, run with that in their theory of the atonement of this double imputation. My sins were bo taken away from, were born by Jesus and I get his righteousness. Is that yeah. a fair? That's the penal substitutionary view. Telling of the view. Yep. Now here are, just while we're here, let's look at some maybe responses to that, some criticisms. Yeah. For me, the most obvious one, at least, that gives me pause or I, it's not immediately obvious to me how this part works is mm -hmm. that you is probably the double imputation part. You, it seems to me unjust to punish somebody who didn't commit the crime. If that really is what we're talking about, that there's a cosmic law that was broken, a divine law, mm -hmm. um, Punishing an innocent third party does nothing to solve the problem that the crime created in the first place. Just mm. like uh, certainly in a modern day courtroom that I would not never find that to be a satisfying resolution. Yeah. Like what you, what's an example? So yeah. Um, a man runs over my wife in a car and I take him to court and he's committed a crime and he's found guilty. He's found guilty. And the judge says you are guilty. And then the, the judge says, but instead of you going to prison, I'll go. It's like, um, I don't, I didn't just that, want someone to go to prison. Not, I wanted him to go to prison. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. You know what I mean? So somewhere there, there's a disconnect that, that doesn't totally make sense to me. Um, how somebody can pay for another person's crimes in terms of receiving a punishment and that make things cosmically okay, cosmically yeah, right yeah. again. That seems not right to me. And I think that's that's fair. Um, we don't really see that too often in modern legal systems. I mean, mm -hmm. there's like you can co-sign for a loan, but you're like opting into this from the outset mm -hmm. that if they default, then you're on the hook. But like they didn't pay. Yeah, but you said you would pay if they didn't. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but I think just to be charitable, like or at least um, how I would explain this kind of language that you see in scripture of sacrifice mm -hmm. is like man this is what that's just what people thought at the time that's yeah. how they made sense of justice right uh they like you had the um the suzerain vassal kings of the ancient near east and there's these little city states and i'm the the, the yarl of the area or whatever and i have these vassals who are like my uh my mouthpieces in mm -hmm. each of these different areas that i've conquered and it's super serious business like they really do speak for me so anything that they say falls back on me like i'm responsible in a way mm -hmm. and so there was vicariousness kind of littered throughout the ancient near east i think um or even uh you see all the time in scripture uh if a bloke does something wrong like the whole family gets killed yeah you're like what the heck why yeah, well yeah. it's just how they uh it was a more communal maybe uh, justice was related more it wasn't as individualistic which i think is what correct me if i'm wrong this is what paul tries to get into when he likens christ to adam that adam in some way had like a headship for the human race mm -hmm. and chose wrongly and as a result we were all sort of under condemnation because of what adam did but christ being the new adam represents humanity as the mm -hmm. new head of humanity and he did it right and as a result we all hooray get to share in his righteousness as a result so to me it makes total sense that the biblical authors would write about Jesus in this way. Oh, if that's, yeah, yes. Um, the, another, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say one other issue I see with this is that it, it can seem like God's hands are somehow tied by justice, whatever mm -hmm. that is, or that, that, um, that his love and his justice stand in contrast to one another instead of being expressions of the same, character or, or being like for example you see in jesus admonishment to love one's enemies forgive those who curse you and um f and then f for jesus to preach that throughout his whole ministry but then on the cross we see 
but God is the exception to the, God doesn't yeah. just forgive. God now, I've needs heard punishment. defenders of penal come back and say, well, uh, an earthly judge would be in dereliction of his duty were he not to sentence the criminal to whatever the law said they should get. Like, right? If, right. They, if they stole, then sure. you go to prison for six months. Sure. And we would hold the judge in contempt if he refused to do it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so, so they uh, would say then, like, well, so God would be in dereliction of his duties of justice mm-hmm. to not get dole out death as mm-hmm. the wage of sin, as scripture says. Well, again, there's different ways you could pull on this to show why it's a problem. But one disanalogy there is the judge the earthly judge did not write the law right like he, right. but in the god case he's responsible for morality as a whole yeah so you might even wonder at the outset because i don't want to prize a theory over reality and what do you know what i mean yeah, and I be um uh a theologist rather yeah. than you know no i know what you're saying worship my theology over what could be and have it violate my God-given moral sensibilities. Yeah. So, uh, it's not, sorry. Can you help me? I'm failing here. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I like, I want to be able to say if God's the one who set up the whole system, the whole thing, cosmos, morality, how you should live, how you shouldn't live, how punishment works, etc. If anyone can forgive, it should be God who has, The like, right to do that. Why are we whining about his hands being tied when he could have just set up the system differently in the first place? Right. So if yeah. if the idea is like, well, justice just demands retribution. Oh, d- does it have to? Right. I thought you were the author of justice. Mm-hmm. Like it stems from your character. Yeah. Uh, and so one pushback I see in the scripture to this idea is the very call to action to forgive. Right. On god's part to us like he tells us to forgive right as we have been forgiven yep and so when i forgive someone the little old sinful clint yeah uh i part of that to me like definitionally means i don't demand something in return yes i don't demand that they do something in order for me to forgive them that's right it would be nice if i got an apology that's right that would help restore the relationship perhaps but Mm -hmm. uh, i'm just asked to forgive unconditionally yeah now, if I'm being asked to do that, it's odd that God doesn't have to. Right. Or wouldn't want like, to. Like, you might just wonder, why doesn't God just forgive sin? He's like, well, the wages of sin is death. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Why does, why do we have to interpret that passage to mean this whole theological package? Yeah. I mean, couldn't the wages just be like, um, instead of the, how should I put it? because you did this, I'm going to do this to you style of punishment. What if it's just death enters into your life because you sin? Mm -hmm. Another way of putting it is death is, or sin is its own punishment, punishment, uh, sin, the sin as poison view. Yeah. Like if I'm, I almost said a really crass example. Let's say, let's say if I'm (laughs) lying to people all the time, Yeah. that's going to bring, uh, a lot of destruction into my life. Not yeah. only mental anxiety of keeping my mm-hmm. lies straight, but, and, but it's probably going to yeah. end up, someone's going to find out and yeah. it's just going to lead to ruin. Yeah. Death. It's a version of death in my life. Uh, life giving things are fleeing my life uh-huh. when I, when sin is abundant as a, nat- as a natural consequence, not as tit right. for tat, uh, retribution. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that the universe might be set up in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it makes a lot more sense of why God would even be interested in giving commands in the first place. Right. Like the Ten Commandments for our is, good. Yeah, it's because it's not, uh, they're not true because God says them. God says them because they're true. Mm. It's kind of that like I'm just that euthyphro dilemma. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go with this horn of it. I don't think of it as that big of a problem. <laughs> yeah, that um, yeah, God commands those things for my own good. Yeah, so. Those are a couple of my quibbles. Oh, so just to really uh, tie a a neat bow on that. If we go with this other version of wages, where sin is its own consequence, then I don't think we need this extra piece of, well, you stand in guilty. Like the word guilt even is a little bit awkward here on that picture. Like I'm guilty before God. I mean, um, 
I mean, in the sense that it it's true you're not morally perfect. Right. You are guilty. Mm-hmm. You're guilty of falling short morally in yeah. some ways. Yeah. I think so. So I, I'm also curious, just one last little piece. You see Christ on the cross praying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I do wonder how that ties in. I, like, was Jesus' prayer answered? And maybe that goes more to the, um, what do we need to do to participate in atonement, mm-hmm. you know? Because I'm sure the ones, not all the soldiers nailing his hands in recognized that he was the son of God or whatever. Mm-hmm. So was Jesus' prayer answered? Were the those one people did, forgiven? Right? One of them, apparently. Yeah. Were those people forgiven? Or did God deny Jesus' prayer? But also God's the one praying it. So Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. kind of praying to himself. So... Okay, so we spent a little while on penal. But that's one way of thinking of the atonement. Mm-hmm. Here's another one. Christus victor. Mm. Christ is victorious. Mm-hmm. And here the idea is Jesus is victorious over the powers and principalities or sin, death, and the devil or something like that. Yep. And you see language like that in the worship songs, like death, death is defeated. Um, death, where is your sting? And all of mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm grave where is your victory so in what sense does this i don't this theory i don't really get okay (laughs) i understand the sentence christ is victorious but in what sense does has death been defeated uh i know people who have still died Mm -hmm. death is something i am still marching towards and And here i think i think the christus victor view definitely brings in more of the resurrection yes the penal view, so we didn't mention oh, it. That's good, yeah. Um, and maybe, and uh, please write into the show if you think resurrection should play a larger role in the penal telling of the story. But yes. I, I didn't think it... The main salvific thing is the paying for sin that now I don't need to do right? yeah, yeah. on penal. Mm-hmm. But on Christus Victor, it's the rising from death that is like a, a, what, a statement about Jesus' position in the cosmos or... Christ the King, Christ is victorious. Well, here, here is someone who has defeated death. Death could not hold him. I, and, I'd like that. Yeah, yeah. And That's I, cool. And I think there's hope. So resurrection's a thing, mm-hmm. I guess. And it seems relatively permanent. Unlike a Lazarus. Yeah. Jeez, what a lisp on that one. <laughs> Lazarus, who Jesus raises from the dead. And presumably, like, he died later. Yeah. Not maybe I don't know how soon or what, mm-hmm. but you know, he's not with us now. No. Um, but Jesus like ascends into heaven. There's the ascension story. And so there's this idea that Jesus is alive today. His defeated death. Is it like saying that death and sin sort of don't get the last word? Cause I don't think it's pretty obvious to me that death and sin are still a problem facing me mm-hmm. existentially. I mean, we talked about that in, in previous episodes. What is the human condition that I need rescuing from? Well, I'm going to die. And I wish that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. And I am morally imperfect, and I wish that wasn't the case. So in what sense does Jesus rising from the dead and defeating sin and death play out in my life, given that I'm still prone to sin, I am still facing death as an existential reality? Mm -hmm. So in what sense are they defeated? Just that they don't have the final word? There's something I contend with in this mortal coil, but... Yeah, I think so. But that there's hope that once i die here physically then i won't deal with sin or permanent personal death yeah there's hope that they won't get the last word i think that's the idea so on that one though on christus victor nothing really happens on the cross other than a tragic murdering of god is that right Hmm. there's no sort of cosmic transaction taking place there with the the blood and the death uh so i view christus victor as um, and I, I think other, um, other theologians, like I'm one, I'm just, I'm just a guy, more of a philosopher than anything. Okay. But, um, if I could add something to discussion in the broader yeah, theological you, conversation, you can, man. I, I prefer to think of Christus Victor as more of a, a general category under which other views can fall. Okay. So may, I mean, man, maybe I kind of want to, yeah, Christus Victor or penal yeah. and other these other views fall underneath Christus Victor. So like one would be ransom theory. 
and this one's a little bit kind of bizarre but sure. um it's kind of interesting too like if we're if we're on board with a proliferation of other spiritual entities like devils and demons yeah and that's for some reason uh that we don't need to go into now that satan it's like the leader of this pack of demons and he somehow has dominion over the earth mm-hmm. uh, this is his domain he's going around prowling like a lion well, we gave him he may devour right in the fall we gave him the keys to the kingdom did we i think so okay yeah maybe i don't I know about know. that i thought that happened how else did he get it mate i thought it was just well i thought it was more he was cast out of heaven down to earth and now they were they were uh-huh. kind of here beforehand uh-huh. already had set dominion. up shop and yeah. then we were created and they're like i don't like that okay all right, all right. so they have they have dominion over the world and um jesus makes a bargain with satan mm-hmm. uh that okay you can have me i'll, I'll lay down my life yeah. i'll sacrifice myself but you have to let them go and release your hold your that you grip have a, on the human heart your grip on yeah the world and so but you the, get to kill me as a result the devil's like yes finally yes, i get to kill god and then Heck yes he does but then jesus kind of tricks the devil like, yeah i can raise from the dead yeah so so, i didn't tell you that but the resurrection's so in my he back gets bait and switched and so humanity now has the keys to the kingdom as you put it mm-hmm. um and so in that way like if christus victory is sin death devil are defeated yeah ransom theory i see is like the filament that focuses on the devil being defeated that's our main enemy are these you know, evil spiritual be- beings bent on our, on malevolence, and I think some proponents of this view really utilize that in their other theologizing, like uh, the problem of evil. Like, yeah, you're thinking like a Greg Boyd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of the bad things that happen in our world are the result of demonic influence, and so Christ finally, like, uh, uh, like the prophecy from Genesis three of um, crushes the serpent's head. Yep. Yeah. The, this is a fulfillment of that, and. Hmm. Now, moral exemplar theory, I also kind of view as a filament of Christus Victor in the sin category. Mm-hmm. That the main thing that's happening through Jesus' life uh, and and death on the cross is the defeat of death. Or sorry, the defeat, the defeat of, of sin. sin. So Jesus is not only like being a perfect revelation of God and like at, um, fulfilling the law, so to speak, of an adding that internal dimension that we spoke of like it's not just your outward deeds but your thought yeah. life matters too yes showcasing that but yeah living a perfect human life he lived rightly a man rightly related to god mm-hmm. and so sin was defeated in his life sin had no hold mm-hmm. over jesus he showed that it can be done mm-hmm. yeah that is that uh and the and the ultimate sinning done to him was uh, so he, and in, in the cross moment, he's experiencing the height of sin, let's say of yeah. the, the, the power of the principalities coming together of the, the government system and the religious system conspiring to kill the God man. Mm-hmm. And in that height of offense, yeah, he forgives. Yeah. So sins defeated there. It's like if there was ever a chance to finally engage in. So he's, exe- he's exemplifying, he's an exemplar, yeah. a, an icon of moral perfection and virtue that's worth emulating. So that's what's happening on the cross. And so yeah. again, back to the beginning, the the initial word of atonement at one, that gap between God and man in the Christus Victor mm-hmm. moral exemplar sin version, the gap would be described as a, a, a moral difference. Mm-hmm. We are not, we're not at one with God because we are not morally blameless and God and Jesus came to, move us along that path into greater union with God. The closer you are to moral perfection, Through moral progress, the more intimate you can be with God. Okay. It's not a way of saying earning salvation no, or anything. No, but, but to know, the degree that you participate in righteousness, if you sin participate is separate, in God. separating yourself from God, mm-hmm. then the less that that happens, yeah. you are more in union with God. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, the ransom theory at one mint is the main reason there's a gulf is demonic activity. Yeah. Evil malevolence is stopping us from being in relationship. And yeah. so Christ comes and severs that chain of bondage. And again, like to your point, we're still grappling with it. Yeah. Uh, they're not finally defeated like they will be on the final, the last days or whatever in judgment. Yeah. But um, there's hope that there will be full reconciliation 
when the kingdom is consummated. The kingdom was inaugurated with Jesus coming. Now it's consummated. Yep. Later, later on. Yep. And that seems like it would be related to the, I guess it would be part of the ransom theory, the language of like us being slaves that are bought back or redeemed. Mm-hmm. Um, we're sort of bought out of bondage. Like he, uh, he paid the price to set us free and then he tricked the devil. Yeah. yeah. Now there, I don't know whether this would count as a type of Christus Victor. Um, I wouldn't, it's not quite the language I would use, but let's call it announcement theory. Yeah. And this is where, um, Jesus came into the world to showcase not just, um, moral perfection, let's say, but in that, like, as see moral perfection, when I think about it, I, I can be easy to think of just, um, doing the right things or thinking the right, not, not violating a a standard. Yeah. But the announcement theory is saying, no, like Jesus came to just demonstrate God's love for you. Mm. It was more, uh, Jesus's life and death was God wanted to say something to you. Right. Rather than, um, God changing his mind about you, like in the penal view where wrath, is directed toward you due to you falling short of the glory of God. And then Jesus comes and now God's mind has changed because when he sees you, he he sees sees the imputation rather on the announcement theory. God never has changed his mind about you. And I'm seeing the perfect revelation of who God is in the person of Jesus. Jesus reveals what has been true about God the whole time Mm -hmm. all along. Yeah, this I'm really attracted to this view. This is a. It's similar to exemplar. It is similar to exemplar, and and, and they may be the same. But and I think think you find this in the Franciscan tradition. They're big on this view of the atonement. Mm -hmm. That I think I think it goes even further than that. That yes, Jesus' entire life was a sort of announcement or a revelation. It's the it's the clearest picture we have of what God is like is what we see in Jesus. He says, "If you've seen me, you've seen the Father." I think the cross and that event reveals two things simultaneously. It it exposes human sin for what it is and evil mm-hmm. that like you just said that in the when confronted with the perfect man our political and religious systems conspire to have him put to death we hate what we see there because of how it reflects on us and that in murdering god we see uh that's that's as tragic as something can get you mm-hmm. know to miss god in front of you and kill him is tragic and so the cross reveals the hatred and violence that can be in us. And at the same time, it exposes God's ridiculous grace for us that he's a God who would let that happen and that would rather die than slay his enemies. So what, what makes that at least unique is that rather than some transaction taking place on the cross, uh, the cross becomes more about, your transformation something that when you see it and and when when this announcement strikes you Mm -hmm. it should change you in some way that looking at the cross and recognizing both your own capacity for evil and god's great capacity for love in spite of that that should change you and that's where the transformation takes place not so much that there was a something occurred in that moment Mm -hmm. jesus just revealed what's been true the whole time that that we're yeah, we're capable of great evil. God is capable of great love. Wouldn't you love a relationship with him? Um, and that recognition will cause transformation in you. Yeah, the other views seem like there's something more cosmic going mm-hmm. on, like a, a whole gestalt shift or mm-hmm. something. Um, a before and after, yeah, of yeah, that moment. Yeah. Yeah. And this view, yeah, is super interesting in that um, kind of preserving almost the immutability Mm-hmm. of god in a way like yeah. the, um god's been this way the whole time yep it's it's less dispensational if, yes. for our more nerdy theology guys that like god god acts in different ways throughout history different kind of sets of Eons rules and chapters yeah. and yeah um no oh, like always thought this way about human beings and here is this now, grand announcement i'm fine with saying it's uh it's the peak announcement that we've had it's the crescendo of something that has been being announced the whole time, Mm -hmm. but has never been more clearly articulated than in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, here's something really interesting. I think a retort Mm -hmm. uh, for, particularly from the ransom and penal view, they might say, well, then why did Jesus have to die? 
Yeah. Because on the penal view and the ransom view, the bondage from the devil or the wrath of God, uh, that we need to deal with that. Right. So like Jesus, something has to happen. Jesus was the only solution. Mm-hmm. And so thus he had to die, uh, perhaps on a cross. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know maybe about that, but he has to die in order to do this. And the announcement view does not say that Jesus has to die. In fact, that's what makes it so tragic and moving. Mm, is say, it, what do you mean? Is, well, just that this, this was a, a terrible mistake that we made that somehow God again used. Like he took the worst of what we had to offer and still somehow used it to communicate his love for us, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I think it's right to feel a sense of like your stomach should sink a little bit when you recognize like he didn't have to go to the cross. Yeah. yeah. We, we did that to him. <laughs> And he voluntarily let us do it. And that should grip you, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but certainly yeah, sounds Yeah, that's what makes scandalous. it beautiful in a way, that, mm-hmm. um, that it didn't have to be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that... Which, I, to be fair, I, I don't know. The On the penal view, maybe they would say second person of the Trinity didn't have to volunteer and say, I'll go and be the substitute. That's something God chose to do. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean... Uh, it gets it gets tricky theologically. It does, it does get tricky because I mean, you and I are pretty in favor of ha- God having moral constraints. Yeah. Again, now it's that's also weird, but like through His own moral character. But um, like I I would think if there is this method where you can save all of humanity by like living for thirty ah. years and dying on a cross to avoid a whole bunch of people being eternally in death. Mm-hmm. Then you should do that. Yeah, you know. So yeah, so I yeah. would say God has a moral obligation in that way. I don't know how many people would agree with that, but right, if that's uh, how the system mm-hmm. works. But on, on this announcement view, there's not something like um that dire at stake. Right. It's that hey, at some point, I really want to reveal who I am to people in a way that still preserves their free will. Yes. I'm not coercive and just like ripping out the. F- uh, through a different dimension, like I'm God, and like everyone on Earth can see him, or different hemispheres at different times. You know, like yeah, it yeah. could be so jarring to where like, oh my gosh, okay, I guess God exists, and I have to yeah. obey and change my life. Like God's more interested in being a little bit more subtle than that. So He appears at a time in history where there's not cameras and iPhones recording things. Yeah. So there's reasonable doubt about yeah. all of it. Yeah. Uh, and here's this announcement of God's perfect love for us and. Mm-hmm. Um, and an invitation to be in relationship with him. Right. It's yeah. not a coercive, strong arming into relationship. If that's if that's man's greatest good, the sumum bonum of being in relationship with God, yep. then it needs to be done, I think, non-coercively. Yeah. Um, that wooing into relationship. Like, look at this. Here is this picture of um, yeah, ultimate sacrifice and... Mm-hmm still forgiving in the midst of the greatest sin. And that itself should be so alluring, or can be so alluring, mm-hmm. that you are compelled to investigate this God further. And here, the gap is uh, relational. Yes. The at, Right? Because if we're, uh, or, if each step is thinking or about... Or epistemic, or knowledge. I don't know how God feels about me. Mm. And it's, well, Jesus says, let me show you how I feel about you. Yeah, yeah. You know. But to me, doesn't that seem more relational than the other ones? Like... Yeah. Well, this has been my... Again, part of my hesitation with the penal substitutionary view is if that's true, my incentive to draw close to the father is kind of damaged somewhat by the mm-hmm. fact that I knew. Does he really love me? Were it not for Jesus. Or does he just love Jesus? And he sees me because of the imputation. And this or is, he sees Jesus because of the imputation. Right. And this is, again, where it st- gets tricky because with Trinity, they're all God. Like Jesus is God. Mm-hmm. And so how Jesus feels about you is how God feels about you. But certainly when I subscribed to that view, how it played out in my life was a sort of subtle imagining Father God as being kind of cranky with me. But thankfully, Mm -hmm. Jesus has taken the brunt of his wrath, so I don't need to. Now, maybe that's a caricature, but it's one that I lived with for a long time. Yeah, yeah. I think we have reason to. Or like the second person, the Jesus figure is demonstrating the love of the Godhead while the father demonstrates the justice uh, and that these two virtues kind of do different things, but love wins out. 
or right. something. It can just yeah. I think it's unnecessarily convoluted. And, uh, yes. And I don't feel compelled, I guess, by the scriptural evidence for that view, which there is some. Mm-hmm. Like, there are certain interpretations of scripture that would lend itself to that view. So it didn't just come out of thin yeah. air. Yeah. And I think it's on. It's a, it's a response. Jeez, what a dork. I can't say this. That... Um, a responsible interpreter would take the time to look at the biblical passages and and see if there are different interpretations for those key passages for the penal view mm-hmm. and lean into different and maybe even more correct ways of interpreting them and getting at the authorial intent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So those are a handful of views on atonement. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have a novel one, don't write into the show. Write a book. You yeah, know, yeah. If you've got a new one, you'd be quite. If there is famous. a name that we're missing for this announcement theory, by all means, tell us what that what we're talking about there. I, we're not the first ones to think of it. That's mm-hmm. for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So if you support what we're doing, we'd love you to comment on the YouTube video and channel. Mm-hmm. That goes a long way to boosting the algorithm and getting this in front of more eyeballs. We'd love that. And. Yeah, if you like to read about ideas too, you can subscribe to the blog at opentotruth.com slash subscribe. Do that when you get home. I know you're lifting or running or driving, but like when you get home, just jump on like, oh yeah, Clint asked me to do that. I'm going to do it. (laughs) And uh, yeah, Yeah. we'll We'll see you next time. We'd love to know what questions you have. So Mm -hmm. write into the show, mailbag at opentotruth.com, leave a comment, and uh, we'd love to interact with you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Stay curious. Stay curious.